this lecture we're going to be looking at the measurement of crime and how crime is measured in the UK um, using the Crime Survey of England and Wales and the official crime rate. But we're also going to analyse how useful this uh, both of these systems are and whether or not um, there are better ways of um, studying crime. But also we'll look at the perspectives on crime just to keep that sociology in there. So before we get into how crime is measured, let's look at some recent stats. So at the moment, the, the most up to date stats we've got are 2019. Covid kind of manipulated the system a little bit, which made it difficult to really use those stats with any meaningful outcomes. But what we can see is over time, yes, there was a peak in crime in the mid 90s, which can be linked to high unemployment at the time, social unrest and um, changes in government. But generally in the last 20 years, we've actually seen a decline in criminal activity over all. Um, and this could be um, down to changes in the collection of data, could be increase in um, technologies, which the law hasn't quite caught up with, for example, cybercrime. Um, it could be that um, the crime control and prevention methods and policies are, are working, if you so wish to believe. Um, but what we see is there have been peaks in criminal activity and there have been declines in criminal activity. Now, you'll notice in figure 17, there is a gap in the data from March um, 2016 to June 2019. That was because and it's also in uh, figure 11 as well. And that was because for those three years, the Crime Survey of England and Wales and the official crime rate lost their official statistic um, label. There, there was discrepancies in how they were collecting the data, which meant that the data was unreliable. So they had to rework the entire system in order to regain their official stati statistics status. So that's why we have a gap between March 2016 and June 2019. But what we can also see in these figures is that certain crimes are still relatively more common than others. For example, in figure 11, we can see that all theft is much higher than, um, say, the violence that was in that we see in figure seven. So figure seven only goes up to 5000 incidents. Um, number of incidents, whereas the graph for England and Wales goes up to 12,000. So although they're different graphs, there is there is a, a, an ability to see that certain crimes are perhaps more prevalent than others. Um, and what we can also see in figure two is the likelihood of um, being a victim of crime does vary from the crime to crime. So, for example, only around 20 percent of adults, meaning over 16s, would have been a victim of crime. And the majority of those are victims of fraud. Now, again, that could be linked to the development of cyber crimes and that people are only just starting to really understand phishing uh, with PH and um, identity theft and ways of keeping people safe online. So the crime stats are interesting in that they can show us trends in crime. Now, these only go back as far as either 1984 or March um, 2004, depending on which figure you're looking at. But these trends are really interesting because they can also be used to link to causes of crime. For example, as I was saying, in the mid 90s, there was high unemployment, there was civil unrest, there were the Northern Ireland troubles, all of these things that were happening um, could have had an impact on the criminal activity. 
Um, and if we were to look at the more recent stats looking at criminal activity over the last three years, we'd probably see quite a massive decline in certain types of crime because there were extended periods of times where we were all at home. And you're not really going to get a home burglary when the entire household is at home. You're not going to get vehicle theft from outside your own home because we're all at home. We can see if somebody's going to steal our car. But there was an increase in domestic violence incidences. So we need to when we're looking at these stats, we do need to think in a wider social context to see why these trends may have occurred. But let's focus on where these statistics come from where these where this data come from. so let's look at the sources of crime then so where do these where does this data come from the first source of data is the official crime survey or sometimes called the official crime rate same thing different name don't know why okay it is compiled through police recorded crime court records and prison records it is published quarterly by the Office of National Statistics, but the data itself is collected by the Department of Justice. So the, the Office of National Statistics just is the ones that put it out there. The DOJ is the one who actually compiles the data. So when we're looking at police recorded crime, what we're actually talking about are the um, crimes that have received a crime number. Now, not um, every time a police officer goes to a crime scene or um, goes to speak to somebody is a crime recorded. So it may be that they deem it too um, trivial or it's not worth investigating for whatever reason. But if a crime is given a crime number and is therefore investigated by the police, it will be inclu included in the official crime survey. Um, they're, they're not worried and concerned about whether or not this ends in an arrest or a conviction. It's just crimes that have been investigated by the police. Court records then are used are about the cases that are taken to court. So an arrest has been made. They have been taken to court and includes data about the defendants and the victims and their social makeup, their ethnicity, their gender, their, their age, social class, etc and also about the types of crime that have been committed and as well as whether or not the defendant was found guilty or not guilty. Prison records look at the composition of people in prison, again looking at their social makeup, ethnicity, gender, age, class, etc. But they also look at the types of crimes that have led to a custodial sentence the length of that sentence and whether or, and also the recidivism rate. So whether or not this these people have reoffended or whether they have it's their first offence. If they have reoffended, it has the crime become more serious that they've um, committed. Are they falling down a deviancy amplification spiral or are they just sticking to the same sort of crimes and still getting caught? The other type of crime data comes from the Crime Survey of England and Wales, which used to be known as the British Crime Survey. But once they lost their official crime, uh, official statistics state, status, they rebranded as the Crime Survey of England and Wales. And this is a continuous survey. So it's ongoing throughout the year and it is a victim or self report survey. So they will send out a letter asking people if they have been a victim of crime. And if the person in the household or the household says yes, they will then interview that person either via video call, telephone call or in person. It's a random sample of 35,000 people annually. They usually ask around 50,000, but around 35,000 will respond. And they will ask adults who are aged over 16. And then if there are any children in the house aged 10 to 15, they will ask parental permission to interview them as well. Again, it is published quarterly um, via the Office of National Statistics. Um, but unlike the crime official crime rate or the official crime survey, this is asking people if they have been a victim of crime, not if the crime was investigated, not if it went to court or anything like that. It's about whether they have been a victim of crime. And these 
this data set is huge. So the police record, uh, police recorded crime comes from every police force in the UK. The court records come from every courthouse, every magistrate's court, every crown court, the Supreme Court, the appeal court. All of that comes together. And although the Crime Survey of England and Wales roughly samples around 35,000 people, it's a continuous survey. So it's not doing it once a year or anything like that. It is ongoing and they're constantly updating which um, and publishing quarterly. But they're not perfect. So we have to be aware that these sources of data do come with limitations. So if we're looking at the crime survey, we've got to remember that not every crime is recorded. As I said, only records crimes that get a crime number. And not all crimes are reported either. People are open, uh, are victims of crime. Maybe they don't know they're a crime. Uh, maybe they don't know they're a victim. There's a lot of reasons why people may not report the crimes that they've been a victim of. There's also government manipulation where crimes may be recorded as something else to make it look like a specific crime is going down. An example of this was with the knife crime policy, the anti knife crime policy from about five years ago, where the Conservative government said we are going to be tough on knife crime. We will bring down knife crime. And the statistics showed that they actually did. But what it didn't show was some of the knife crime, instead of being recorded as a knife crime, was recorded as an assault with a weapon. So it may not be that the crime, the specific crimes that they're targeting are actually in decline. They're just being relabeled as something else to make it look that way. And also we have invisible crimes or victimless crimes where there's nobody to report the crime, such as corporate crime and white collar crime, where um, the criminal justice system may not even be involved. When it comes to the Crime Survey of England and Wales, as I said, it is a self-report survey, it is a victim survey, so it relies on memory. It also, people are saying what they believe they've been a victim of, so there's a lack of specialist knowledge. They may say they've been a victim of an assault when in fact it was grievous bodily harm or actual bodily harm. So we have to be aware that the people reporting what crimes they've been a victim of may not actually have the knowledge to accurately label the crime that they've been a victim of. There's also the issue of researcher effect where the um, victim may not admit to the extent of the criminal um, crime that they've been a victim of because they feel embarrassed. For example, particularly if somebody has been a victim of a sex crime or some form of domestic abuse or abuse in general, where they really don't wish to admit to it. And again, we have that problem of invisible crimes where people don't know that they have been a victim of it. So the stats, although useful, do come with some quite serious limitations. Consider the dark figure of crime. So what we mean by that is that the crime statistics that we look at, which we analyse and use in sociological research, only show the top of the iceberg. And the dark figure of crime are all the things that all the statistics, all the crimes or the events that don't actually make it into the crime survey or the um, crime survey of England and Wales because they only look at the top of the iceberg. So why is it that crime might go unreported? This is a quite personal thing for the victim. So this is only a few ideas. There are many, many more that could also be included. But the big ones are embarrassment, that they've been maybe a victim of a sex crime, or maybe that they've been conned or defrauded, or that they were put in a situation where they were a victim. They may be fearful of repercussions from the um, perpetrator or fear of the police. They may be fearful of being um, of repercussions from their community, particularly in cases of honour crimes and things like that. 
They may not know they're a victim. You can't report something that you don't know. And or they may decide to deal with it themselves. They don't trust the police. So they're kind of like, you know what, I'm just going to deal with this myself. I'm not going to get the police involved. It will just escalate the situation. I'll just do it myself. Or they may be from a be fearful of um, implicating themselves in a different crime. So there's a lot of reasons why crime might go unreported. But if it's unreported, it doesn't make it into the stats. There's also lots of reasons for unrecorded crime. So not all crime enters the official statistics or the official figures. And there are a number of reasons for that. Police priorities and targeting change. Is they're targeting one particular area, one particular group of people, one particular criminal type of crime, others may fall through the cracks. The status of the victim can have a big impact on whether or not the crime is reported. It's um, been reported in the last few years that um, sex workers, even if they report a sexual assault, it is unlikely to go anywhere. It's unlikely to be recorded in statistics because the police won't investigate it because they see them as low priority victims or that they may have brought it on themselves because they are a sex worker. Not my belief, but that is something that could could happen. And you also have to think about work relations and whether or not how people or police officers have to interact with other officers. We're going to look at that in a little bit more depth now. So when it comes to the record, not recording of crime, more Aitken and Chapman talk about police triage and the way that the police will determine whether or not a crime goes on to the crime statistics. So the first thing they've got to think about is promotions and relations at work. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen the film Hot Fuzz and the character played by Simon Pegg, who nobody really likes because he's too good at his job. He makes everybody else look bad. Um, hence why he gets sent off to the West Country and ends up with the whole devil worship thing with Timothy Dalton. And if you haven't seen it, highly recommend it. Um, but police officers will be aware that they have to interact with other officers and other um, people at work and they don't want to be that police officer. So that may influence whether or not they record a crime. Police officers will also be the ones to determine the classification of the crime. Was it ABH? Was it GBH? Was it common assault? Was it pickpocketing? Was it theft? And that can then again influence what happens with the, the statistics. I've already mentioned about the status, uh, social status of the victim. The higher the status of the victim, the more likely it is that their, the crime will be recorded and investigated. The lower the victim status of the victim, the less likely it is to happen. The homeless, sex workers, drug addicts, these are sorts of people where crimes against them often go unrecorded, even if they are reported. Whereas crimes against the middle class, the upper class, the rich and the powerful, even if relatively minor, will still be recorded. The seriousness of the crime. You can't just ignore a murder, for example. But a petty theft, you might just give somebody a slap on the wrist. So it all comes down to police discretion. And um, more Aiken and Chapman refer to this as police triage. And police do this because they are unable to um, investigate every single crime that occurs. So they have to be able to differentiate between what to investigate and what not. And with court recorded crimes, we have to remember that not all crimes are taken to court for prosecution. So even if an arrest is made, the Crown Prosecution Service have a two stage test to determine whether or not something will actually go to court. The first is the likelihood of conviction based on the pre evidence presented. If they taking a case to court is expensive, 
it costs around two thousand three thousand pounds just to have the courtroom per day you then got the cost of the judges and the bailiffs and the court reporter and everybody else that's involved in the case so the crown prosecution service have a budget so they're going to look at whether or not they have a high likelihood of convicting the criminal the uh, defendant based on the evidence presented now if they think actually we're certain that this person did this crime but we're not certain that we could get a conviction in court they may go for a plea deal okay and say plead guilty to a slightly lesser offense we won't take it to court and we'll be done and dusted we'll go straight to sentencing or they may refer it back to the police and say we don't have enough evidence to prosecute we can't take it to court the second stage is whether or not it's in the public interest to prosecute there are lots of crimes on the statute books where yes it is a criminal offense but taking the crime the crime to court isn't really in the public interest so for example under the law if two under 16 year olds have sex they could receive up to five years in prison according to the law however it is not in the public interest to prosecute these two say 15 year olds for having sex so the crown prosecution won't prosecute now parents could then go for a civil case or um, refer to social services or something like that but the likelihood of a 15 year old being taken to court for underage sex and receiving a five-year prison sentence or youth offenders sentence is extremely unlikely because it is not in the public interest so the crown prosecution service have to weigh up is this worth prosecuting or are we better off going for a plea deal or is it better off just to give them a slap on the wrist and tell them not to do it again but in both cases these court report these crimes would not make it onto court recorded crime because they never make it to court okay so what do these perspectives think about these statistics well as you can imagine functionalists are very um pro these official statistics they accept these statistics at face value as they see them as reliable and valid sources of data they are coming from this as a from a positivist perspective they are objective they are reliable they are valid now we know that that's not entirely true but functionalists would believe so marxists are a little bit more um, critical of official statistics and see them as being biased as they are constructed by the ruling class and this links back to our ideas of selective law enforcement and selective law making they also argue that the crime statistics ignore white collar and corporate crime which therefore suggests criminals are all working class which is not necessarily the case feminists very similar to the marxists but they see that the statistics underrepresent the extent of female criminality but also the role of women as victims in crime they suggest that um, crimes such as rape and sexual assault and domestic violence rarely make it beyond the reporting stage now that could be if you remember back to our study of um, domestic abuse in families and households because women will or victims will re retract their complaints due to fear of repercussions or that they the crime is seen as a domestic and therefore private matter interactionists believe that um, the statistics are a social construction and distort the reality of criminality they are more likely to say um, more about who has created the crime rates rather than what is actually happening in criminality left realists tend to be more towards the functionalist they are more critical and they are accepting of the social construction of the um, statistics and the exaggeration of working class crime but they're broadly accurate according to the left 
realists. 